Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> and welcome to the Varietal Show. Or sorry, Fireside Fairy Tales, wrong show. Um, if you've never been here before, well, thank you for stopping by and giving it a shot. What we do on Tuesday nights here on Varietal Literature's YouTube page is we read old folklore and fairy tales together. There's a live chat in the corner where you can join in if you're here live. If you're not here live, though, down in the description below will be timestamps. And tonight we're reading one story, which is called Laura Silver Bell from Sheridan Lafan. Um, and you can jump ahead to that because I'm going to say a little bit about uh, Sheridan and uh, a little bit about the story before we start. But that may not interest you. What this stream is, is essentially storytelling in an old style way with a little bit of a fireplace. And we all sort of join in and chat about it a bit. And I, I um, yeah. That's about it, uh, <clears throat> if that is of interest to you. Oh, and there will be a little bit of sound effects as well, especially around the spooky season. Now we are doing sort of horror, or we, what I would probably more accurately call weird fiction, right? Uh, for the month of October, because it is the season for it. But um, I think it is worth pointing out that in general, we don't really do horror. If you don't like horror, maybe, Check out the playlist. There's a, a year's worth of content there. Uh, GS is in the chat and says, good evening. Good evening, GS. Tonight, we're going to talk about what I call the father of Irish horror stories. Frankly, the father of kind of modern ghost stories, uh, depending on how you want to define modern. The thing is, though, you say anything like that on the internet, and there's going to be like 10 other people are going to be like, have you ever heard of blah, blah, make blah, blah from 1617 who was this and that and whatever else I'm not really saying this as an academic thing is what i'm trying to say for me i don't really know anybody who established the tropes of a of a sort of victorian ghost story or or those sort of things we associate with horror tales in modern time i don't know somebody earlier really and consistent in that delivery of that kind of content than sheridan lafan obviously stories are very um diverse throughout any writer's career so i'm sure there are counter examples in other words don't take it too seriously um sheridan lafan uh tends to write about folklore but i would be remiss especially on a folklore stream to not clarify <laughs> that it's not folklore and i guess what i mean by that is um uh when i say that it's not um folklore i almost feel conflicted about it i'm saying it because technically it isn't folklore is sort of community grown without particularly single authors and it can be tropes and characters and whatever else what sheridan lafanu is doing is um he is uh taking stories of his childhood which he grew up in ireland uh and framing them in a more modern structure and a more deliberate story structure rather than just collected tales and that's what we're going to look at today we've looked at one of his stories before um which was uh the boy who went with the fairies this has a similar premise on the surface although it is ultimately a very different story uh we did that last year it is hands down my favorite horror story we've read on the streams um <clears throat> but uh yeah he is uh i think his most famous work if you are a person who pursues this stuff which we can never read on this channel because it is simply too long it's basically a book if if it's not a full book it's a novella but uh called carmilla i think and it is effectively about gay vampire ladies, um, which uh, sounds uh, maybe a little crass put that way, but it is kind of famous for it. And it is very unique in how it presents those topics, for, especially for its time. Um, <clears throat> uh, and in other words, he is uh, an inv innovative and interesting writer. Um, I'm sure somebody, I haven't really looked that much into his backstory, so I'm sure that maybe there's some terrible stuff about him, but I just know the writing. Um, let's talk just briefly about the story before I get started. Again, if you don't want to hear any of this down in the description below, there will be a timestamp that you can jump ahead to the beginning of the story. Um, uh, just two things really quick. 
Uh, this is an old style horror story, which means that they kind of backload the horror elements to the last act. Uh, we don't do that as much in modern writing for a pretty straightforward reason, which is getting your attention is tough. And if you can't do it in the first few sentences, you tend to never get your reader. And so the big advice now is to basically give away the game in the first paragraph, um, which, you know, I don't know if it's the, uh, a bad thing. It's just a change in style over time. But this comes from a time where it just assumes you're going to stick with the story to the end. So if you're listening to it and you're like, what? How is this horror? Where's the horror elements? They're coming. With that said, though, let's clarify what I mean by horror. I don't mean the psychic impact of a movie like The Exorcist or Saw. They're stories, horror stories, sort of weird fiction stories, which is, again, probably the better term for this, are atmospheric above all else unsettling and tend to talk touch on dark and grim topics uh whether that is deaths in the family um abuse um uh, uh kidnapping um you know and various other dark sides of humanity get discussed in the frame of you know fairies and ghosts and whatever else uh and that's this story as well it's a disturbing story it may not exactly make you squeal or something like a, a door swinging open in a horror movie will but it unsettles you it's that kind of horror uh that said sheridan is of his time and one of the things that comes of that time is when they write people who spoke in particular accents they wrote the dialogue with the accent in the spelling and it is a convention i am very glad to say has fallen well out of favor because it made for about 60 years books almost unreadable actually longer than 60 years um <clears throat> the problem is this was actually i did plan to read laura silver bell last year and i ended up not doing it because of this fact but we're gonna get through it <laughs> I did practice all of this dialogue today, but the fact of the matter is, it is written in such a way I cannot get away from doing my best Irish accent. Uh, I'm not Irish, as you may have noticed. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and some of the spelling and some of the words, I genuinely don't know what they mean. I looked them up, I tried to figure it out. Some of them, I just it's just Irish slang that I don't know. Um, so heads up about that. Uh, occasionally, if I feel like I've really, a string of thoughts in dialogue really didn't make sense for a modern audience, I may give you a quick little summary of what was just said. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. I, I apologize for the fact that he does accented writing, um, and that will be a bit of a stumbling block in places. Um, hang out to the last act if you're here for horror, because if that's where it's sort of reaches its atmospheric conclusion. I wouldn't say, again, it's like terribly, horribly disturbing that you can never sleep again, but it is unsettling and atmospheric. Um, and uh, while it is not technically folklore because it is just a single author story from Sheridan, um, it is pretty closely related. It's like second generation, I guess. I don't know how you want to think of that. With that said, I'm going to have a good long drink of water. And then we're going to get to the story. <clears throat> also, what is your favorite ghost story, chat, if you're out there in, in the world? If you even have one. It doesn't have to be written, obviously that's an interesting one but all right now this takes place in a bit of a bog so let's get a little bit of boggy atmosphere Our story tonight comes to us from Sheridan Lafon. And it is called Laura Silver Bell. And it is not for kids. So, 
make your call on your audience right now. <clears throat> In the five Northumbrian counties, you will scarcely find so bleak ugly and yet in a savage way so picturesque a moor as dardale moss the moor itself spreads north south east and west a great undulating sea of black peat and heath What we may term its shores are wooded wildly with birch, hazel, and dwarf oak. No towering mountains surround it, but here and there you have a rocky knoll rising among the trees and many a wooded promontory of the same pretty because utterly wild forest running out onto its dark level. Habitations are thinly scattered in this barren territory and a full mile away from the meanest was the stone cottage of Mother Kark. Let not my southern reader, who associates ideas of comforts with the term cottage mistake. By southern here, he is not talking about the U.S. <clears throat> southern Ireland. Um... This thing is built of shingle with low walls. Its thatch is hollow. The peat smoke curls stingingly from its stunted chimney. It is worthy of its savage surroundings. The primitive neighbors remark that no rowan tree grows near, nor holly, nor bracken, and no horseshoe is nailed on the door. Which, for those who don't know, means that they're not the holiest folk. <clears throat> not far from the birches and hazels that straggle about the rude wall of the little enclosure. On the contrary, they say you may discover the broom and the ragwort in which witches mysteriously delight. But this is perhaps nothing more than scandal. Mal Kark, who was many a year ago the sage femme of this wild domain. That's midwife, person who delivers babies. She has renounced this practice, however, for some years, and now under the rose she dabbles, it is thought, in the black art, in which she has always been secretly skilled, tells fortunes, practices charms and in popular esteem is little better than a witch. Mother Kark has been away to the town of Willarden to sell knit and stockings and is returning to her rude dwelling by Dardale Moss. To her right, as far away as the eye can reach, the moor stretches. The narrow track she has followed here tops a gentle upland and at her left a sort of jungle of dwarf oak and brushwood approaches its edges. The sun is sinking blood red in the west. His disc has touched the broad black level of the moor and his parting beams glare athwart the gaunt figure of the old Beldam. As she strides homeward, stick in hand, <clears throat> bringing into relief the folds of her mantle. Which gleam like the draperies of a bronze image in the light of a fire. And for a few moments, this light floods the air tree gorse rock and bracken glare and then it is out and gray twilight over everything all is still and somber 
and at this hour the simple traffic of the thinly peopled country is over nothing can be more solitary from this jungle, nevertheless, through which the mists of evening are already creeping, she sees a gigantic man approaching her. In that poor and primitive country, robbery, country robbery is a crime unknown. She therefore had no fears for her pound of tea and pint of gin and sixteen shillings in silver, what she is bringing home in her pocket. But there is something that would have frighted another woman about this man. He is gaunt, somber, bony, dirty, and dressed in a black suit, which a beggar would hardly care to pick up out of the dust. This ill-looking man nodded to her as she stepped on the road. I don't know you, she said. And he nodded again. I never seen you anywhere, she exclaimed sternly. Fine evening, Mother Cock, he says and holds his snuff box towards her. Snuff box, if you don't know, is tobacco. She widened the distance between them by a step or so and said again, sternly and pale, If not to say to thee, who are thou, beast? You know Laura Silverbell. That's a by name. The lass's name is Laura Lou. She answered, looking straight for her, before her. One name is as good as another for one that was never christened, mother. How know you that? She asked grimly, for it is a received opinion in that part of the world that the fairies have power over those who have never been baptized. The stranger turned to her with a malignant smile. There is a young lord in love with her, the stranger says. And I am that lord. Have her at your house tomorrow night at eight o'clock and you must stick cross pins through the candles as you have done for many a one before to bring her lover thither by ten and her fortunes made take this for your trouble for those confused he's basically saying go do a charm to bring a lover to the girl because she's kind of a witch <clears throat> and he's going to pay her for those services, which is how it goes. He extended his long finger and thumb toward her with a guinea temptingly displayed. A guinea is a rather uh, large denominational coin of the time. Uh, it's really hard to translate money this old as to what it would be now, but like it's at least a couple hundred dollars, probably. I have not to do it. I never said it, seen you before. Get thee away! I earn nay a gold of thee, and I'll take none. Away with thee, and I'll find thee that I'll make thee. I haven't earned your money. Go away. That's the gist of it. She doesn't trust him. The old woman had stopped and was quivering in every limb as she thus spoke. Well, at that, he looked very angry. And sulkily, he turned away at her words and strode slowly toward the wood which he had come. And as he approached it, he seemed to her to grow taller and taller, stalked into it as high as a tree. I can see thee, 
There would come something of it, she said to herself. Farmer Lou must get it done next Sunday. That old oppy. I don't know what oppy means, by the way. It, looked, it comes up a few times. But what she's saying is uh, her father should have christened her and he should do it next Sunday. Old Farmer Lou was one of that sect who insisted that baptism shall be but once administered. And not until the Christian candidate had attained to adult years. The girl had indeed for some time been, been of an age, not only, according to his theory, to be baptized, but if need be, to be married. Her story was a sad little romance. <clears throat> A lady some 17 years before had come down and paid Farmer Lou for two rooms in this house. She told him that her husband would follow her in a fortnight and that he was in the meantime delayed by business in Liverpool. In 10 days after her arrival, her baby was born. Mal Kark acting as Sage Fam again, midwife. Um, on the occasion, and on the evening of that day, the poor young mother died from childbirth. No husband came, no wedding ring, they said, was on her finger. About 50 pounds was found in her desk, which Farmer Lou, who was a kind old fellow, had lost his two children, put in bank for the little girl, and resolved to keep her until a rightful owner should step forward and claim her. They found half a dozen love letters signed Francis and calling the dead woman Laura. So Farmer Lou had the little girl Laura and her sobriquet of Silver Bell was derived from a tiny silver bell once gilt, which was found among her poor mother's little treasures after her death, which the child wore on a ribbon around her neck. By the way, if anyone knows about the symbolism of silver bells here, I'm very curious. It's obviously significant. <clears throat> Thus, being very pretty and merry, she grew up as a North Country farmer's daughter, and the old man, as she needed more looking after, grew older and less able to take care of her. So she was, in fact, very nearly her own mistress, and did pretty much in all things as she liked. Old Mal Kark, by some caprice, for which no one could account, cherished an affection for the girl who saw her often, paid her many a small fee in exchange for secret indications of the future. It was too late when Mother Kark reached her home to look for a visit from Sir Laura Silverbell that day. So about three o'clock the next afternoon, Mother Kark was sitting, knitting with her glasses on outside her door on the stone bench, when she saw the pretty girl mount lightly on top of the stile at her left under the birch, against the silver stem of which she leaned her slender hand and called, Mama, Mother Clark, are you alone by yourself? Aye, Laura Lass, we can be close now. And if you want a word with me, says the old woman, rising with a mysterious nod and beckoning her stiffly with her long fingers. The girl was assuredly pretty enough for a lord to fall in love with. Only look at her. A profusion of rippling brown hair parted low in the middle of her forehead almost touched her eyebrows and made the pretty oval of her face by the breadth of that rich line more marked. What a pretty little nose, what scarlet lips and large, dark, dark, long-fringed eyes. Her face is transparently tinged with those clear Murillo tints which appear in deeper dyes on her wrists and the backs of her hands. These are the beautiful gypsy tints with which the sun dyes young skin so richly. 
The old woman eyes all this and her pretty figure, so round and slender, and her shapely little feet, cased in the thick shoes that can't hide their comely proportions as she stands on the top of the stile, but it is with a dark and saturnine aspect. Come, lass, what stand ye atop a wall for? Where folk come may chance to see thee. I have a thing to tell thee, lass. She beckoned her again. And I have a thing to tell thee, Mo. Come hither, said the old woman peremptorily. But ye mauna give me a creepins. Which, thankfully, he tells us what this means. You're going to make me tremble. I want to look into the glass of water, mind ye. I think that means I want to see the future. The old woman smiled grimly and changed her tone. Now, honey, get the down. And let Ma see thy canny face. And she beckoned her again. Laura Silverbell did get down and stepped lightly toward the door of the old woman's dwelling. Take this, said the girl, unfolding a piece of bacon from her apron, and I have a silver sixpence to give thee when I am gone away home. They entered the dark kitchen of the cottage, and the old woman stood by the door, lest their conference should be lighted on by surprise. Afore ye begin, said Mother Kark. And then he says in brackets, Sheridan, I soften her patois. <laughs> Could you have done that sooner? <laughs> I must tell you, there's ill folk watching you. What old Farmer Lou about? He doesn't get <clears throat> to sir, the clergyman, to baptize thee? If he lets Sunday next pass, I'm afeard you'll never be sprinkled nor signed with the cross. And well, there's a sky above us. Above us. Oi! exclaims the girl. Who is looking after me? Now, in our language, that would mean who's taking care of me. But what it means is who is looking for me. A big black fella, as high as the kipples, came out of the wood near Dead Men's Grike. After, just after the sun got down yesterday evening. I knew well what he was, for his feet ne'er touched the road while he made it as if he walked beside me. And he wanted me to give me snuff first, and I wouldn't have it. And he offered me a gowden guinea, but I was no sick oppy. And to bring you here tonight, and cross the candle with pins, to call your lover in. And he said he's a great lord and in love with thee. And you refused him? Well, for thee I did, lass, said Mother Kark. Why, it's every word true, cries the girl vehemently, staring to her feet, for she had seated herself on the great oak chest. True, lass. Come, say what you mean, demanded Mal Clark with a dark and searching gaze. Last night I was coming home from the wake with old farmer Dykes and his wife and his daughter Nell and when we came to the stile I bid them good night and we parted. And you came by the path alone in the night time, did you? exclaimed old Mall Clark sternly. I wasn't afraid. I don't know why. The path home led down by the wash of oh, old Hawthorn Castle. I think they're saying river there. I know a river is there, so. I know it well. And a darly path it is. You'll keep indoors a night for a while or you'll rue it. What saw ye? No fretting, mother. Not I was feared on. You heard a voice calling your name. I heard now it was that was thou, but the holy who in the old castle was answered the pretty girl. I heard a noise, a partying noise, near the old castle. <clears throat> I heard nor said now that's down, but Mickle, that's Connie and Gladsome. It's not a bad thing that I heard this noise. It sounded joyful and cheerful and full of a party. I heard singing and laughing a long way off. I can see it. And I stopped a bit to listen. And then I walked on a step or two. And there, sure enough, in the pie mag field under the castle walls, not twenty steps away, I saw a great company, 
silks and satins and men with velvet coats with good old lace striped over them and ladies with necklaces that would dazzle ye and fans as big as griddles and powdered footmen like that the shura he'd behind his coach only that it was ten times as grand nah, it was a full moon last night said the old woman so bright twould blind ye to look at it said the girl Never an ill sight, but the deer finds a light. I think it might be saying devil. Quoth the old woman. There's a running brook there. You were at this side, and they at that. Did they try to make you cross over? Crossing rivers is a big deal in folklore. I guide, didn't they? Not but the civility and kindness, though. But you man... Let me tell it my own way. They was talking and laughing and eating and drinking out of long glasses and good cups and seated on the grass and music was playing and I kicking the behind the bush at all the grand doings. And up there it gets to dance and says a tall fella I didn't see a before. You man step across and dance with a young lord that's fallen in love with thee. And that's myself. And sure enough, I kicked him out under my lashes and a conny lad he is. To my taste, though he be dressed in black, with sword and sash, velvet twice as fine as they sell in the shops at Gowden Friars, and kicking at me again from the corner of his eye. And that same fellow told me that he was mad in love with me, and his father was there, and his sister, and they all came all the way from Caststein Castle to see me at night, and that is the other side of Gowden Friars. Come, lass, you're no mufflin. Tell me true. What was he like? Was his face grimmed with soot? A tall fellow with wide shoulders. And looked like an ill thing with black clothes amassed in rags. His face was long, but well fared, well fared. In darker nor a gypsy. I don't know why like gypsy is the only dark skin thing he references gypsy is not a good thing to say by the way just to put frame on that it's a it's a thing that had its time <clears throat> let's put it that way and his clothes were black and grand and made of velvet and he said he was the young lord himself and he looked like it That'll be the same fella I said at Deadman's Grike, said Mall Kark, with an anxious frown. What matter? How could that be? cried the lass with a toss of her pretty head and a smile of scorn. But the fortune teller made no answer, and the girl went on with her story. When they began to dance, continued Laura Silver Bell, he urged me again, but I wouldn't step over. The river. "'Twas partly pride, cause I wasn't dressed fine enough, and partly contrariness or something. But gah, I wanna. Not a foot. No, but I more nor half wished it was at the time. Well, for thee didst thou not cross the brook. In other words, in your own interest, you didn't end up doing that. Hoity toity, why not? Keep at home after nightfall. Don't ye be walking yourself by daylight, or any light laying lonesome ways, till after you're baptized, said Mulkark. But I'd like to be married first. Take care that marriage won't hang at the bell ropes, said Mother Kark. Leave me alone for that. The young lord said he was most daft with love of me. He wanted to give me a Conny ring with a beautiful stone in it, but drat it, I was sick and happy, and I wouldn't take it, and he, being a young lord. Again, I don't know what sick happy means. If you are Irish, you're probably not still watching the stream. <laughs> lord, indeed, are you daft or dreaming? Those fine folk, what were they? I'll tell you. Dobbies and fairies. And if you don't do as you're bid, they'll take you. And you'll never get out of their hands again where the gas grows, said the old woman grimly. 
<coughs> Out with it, replied the girl impatiently. Who's daft and dreaming now? I'd been dead with fear if twas such a thing. It couldn't be. All was so lovesome and bonny and simply. And shapely, rather. Well, what do you want of me, lass? said the old woman sharply. I want to know. Here's to sixpence. What I should do, said the young lass. Twould be a pity to lose such a marrow, eh? Say your prayers, lass. I can't help ye, said the old woman darkly. If you go with the people, you'll never come back. You manna talk with him, nor eat with him, nor drink with him, nor take a pins with, by way of a gift from him. Mark well what I say, or you're lost. Lost. The girl looked down, plainly much vexed. The old woman stared at her with a mysterious frown steadily for a few seconds. Tell me, lass, and tell me true. Are ye in love with the lad? What for said I? said the girl with a careless toss of her head and blushing up to her very temples. Oh, I see how it is, said the old woman with a groan, and repeated the words, sadly thinking, I see how it is, and walked out the door a step or two and looked jealously around. The lass is witched. The lass is witched. In other words, she's charmed, like magically. That's why she's so infatuated by this fellow. Did you see him since? Asked Mother Kark, returning. The girl was still embarrassed, but now she spoke in a lower tone and seemed subdued. I, I thought I said him as I came here. Walk him beside me among the trees. But I consider it was only the trees themselves that looked like running one behind the other as I walked on. I can tell thee now, last. But what I tell ye, you for, for? Answered the old woman peremptorily, peremptorily. Get ye home. Don't delay on the way. And say your prayers as you go. And let none but good thoughts come nigh. And put ne'er a foot outside the door, Stein, again, till you go to be christened. And get that done a Sunday next. And with this charge, given with grisly earnestness, she saw her over the stile and stood upon it watching her retreat until the trees quite hid her and her path from view. The sky grew cloudy and thunderous. And the air darkened rapidly as the little girl, a little frightened by Mal Kirk's view of the case, walked homeward by the lonely path among the trees. A black cat, which had walked close by her, for these creatures sometimes take a ramble in search of their prey among the woods and thickets, crept out from under the hollow of an oak. It was again with her, it seemed to her, to grow bigger and bigger and bigger as the darkness deepened. And its green eyes glared as large as half pennies in her affrighted vision as the thunder came booming along the heights from the Wivel Arden Road. She tried to drive that cat away, but it growled and hissed awfully, and it set up its back as if it would spring at her, and finally it skipped up into a tree where they grew thickest at each side of her path, and a 
accompanied her high overhead, hopping from bow to bow as if meditating a pounce upon her shoulder. Her fancy being full of strange thoughts, she was frightened, and she fancied that it was haunting her steps, destined to undergo some hideous transformation, and the moment she ceased to guard her path with prayers. While she was frightened for a while after she got home and the dark looks of Mother Kark were always before her eyes and a secret dread prevented her passing the threshold of her home again that night. The next day, though, it was different. She got rid of the awe with which Mother Kark had inspired her. She could not get the tall, dark-featured lord in the black velvet dress out of her head. So handsome and comely was he. He had taken her fancy. She was growing to love him. And she could think of nothing else. Bessie Hennick, a neighbor's daughter, came to see Laura Silverbell that day and proposed a walk toward the ruins of Haworth Castle to gather blueberries. So off the two girls went together. And in the thicket, along the slopes near the ivied walls of Haworth Castle, the companions began to fill their baskets. Hours passed. The sun was sinking near the west, and Laura Silver Bell had not come home. Over the hatch of the farmhouse door, the maids leaned ever and anon with outstretched necks, looking for a sign of the girl's return and wondering, as the shadows lengthened, what had become of her. At last, just as the rosy sunset gilding began to overspread the landscape, Bessie Hennick, weeping into her apron, made appearance without Laura. Her account of their adventures was curious. I will relate the substance of it more connectedly than her agitation would allow her to give it, and without the disguise of the rude Northumbrian dialect. Come on, Sheridan, lay off. The girl said that as they got along together among the brambles that grow beside the brook that bounds the pie mag field, she saw <clears throat> on a sudden she on a sudden saw a very tall, big boned man with an ill favored smirched face and dressed in worn and rusty black, standing at the other side of a little stream, she was frightened. And while looking at this dirty, wicked, starved figure, Laura Silverbell touched her, gazing at the same tall scarecrow, but with a countenance full of confusion and even rapture. She was peeping through the bush which behind which she stood, and with a sigh she said, Is not that a conny lad? See his bonny velvet clothes, his sword and sash. That's a lord, I can tell you. Will I know who he follows, who he loves, who he'll wed? Bessie Hennick thought her companion daft. See how lovesome he looks, whispered Laura. Bessie looked again and saw him gazing at her companion with a malignant smile, and at the same time he beckoned her to approach. There, ta, go not near him, he wring thy neck, gasped Bessie in great fear as he, she saw Laura step forward with the look beautiful bashfulness and joy. She took the hand he stretched across the stream. More for love of the hand than any need of help. And in a moment was across and by his side and his long, long arm 
wrapped about her waist. First to El Bessie. I'm going my ways, she called, leaning her head to his shoulder. And tell good father lo, I'm going my ways to be happy. And maybe at long last I'll see him again. And with a farewell wave of her hand, she went away with her dismal partner. And Laura Silver Bell was never more seen at home or among the copies and wickwoods, the bonny fields and bosky hollows by Dardale Moss. Now Bessie Hannock followed them for a time. She crossed the brook, and through them they seemed to move slowly enough, and though they seemed to move slowly enough, she was obliged to run to keep them in view. She all the time cried to her continuously, Come back! Come back, Bunny Lori! Until, getting over a bank, she was met by a white-faced old man, and so frightened was she that she thought she fainted outright. At all events, she did not come to herself until the birds were singing their vespers in the amber light of sunset. And the day was over. No trace of the direction of Laura's flight was ever discovered. Weeks and months passed and more than a year. At the end of that time, one of Mal Kark's goats died. As she suspected by the envious practices of a rival witch who lived at the far end of Dardale Moss. So all alone, in her stone cabin, the old woman had prepared her charm to ascertain the author of her misfortune. With the heart of a dead animal, stuck all over with pins, was burnt in the fire, and the windows and doors and every other aperture of the house being first carefully stopped. After the heart, thus prepared with suitable incantations, is consumed in the fire, the first person who comes to the door or passes by it is the offending magician. In other words, who killed their, her goats. Well, Mother Cark completed these lonely rites at dead of night. It was a dark night with the glimmer of the stars only and a melancholy night wind <clears throat> was sowing through the scattered woods that spread around. And after a long and dead silence, there came a heavy thump at the door. And a deep voice called her by name. Mall Cluck. She was startled for she had expected no man's voice. And peeping from the window, she saw in the dim light a coach and four horses with gold-laced footmen and a coachman in wig and cocked hat turned out as if for a state occasion. She unbarred the door and a tall gentleman dressed in black waiting at the threshold entreated her as the only sage femme within reach to come in the coach and attend Lady Lairdale, who was about to give birth to a baby, promising Mall Clark, handsome payment for the effort. Lady Lairdale, well, she'd never heard of her. How far away does it? Twelve miles on the old road to Golden Friars. Her avarice is roused, and she steps into the coach. The footman claps the horse, <clears throat> claps to the door, and the glass jingles with the sound of a laugh. The tall, dark-faced gentleman in black is seated opposite, 
and they drive driving at a furious pace. They've turned out of the road and into a narrow one, dark with thicker and loftier forests than she was accustomed to. She grows anxious, for she knows every road and bypath in the country around, and yet she has never seen this one. He encourages her. The moon has risen above the edge of the horizon, and she sees a noble old castle. Its summit of tower and watchtower and battlement glimmers faintly in the moonlight. This was surely their destination. But she feels on a sudden all but overpowered by sleep. But although she nods, she is quite conscious of the continued motion, which has become even rougher. She makes, makes an effort and rouses herself. What has become of the coach, the castle, the servants? Nothing but a strange forest remains. She is jolting along on a rude hurdle, seated on rushes and a tall, big bone man in rags sits in front, kicking with his heel, the ill-favored beast that pulls them along, of which every bone sticks out. Holding the halter which serves for reins, they stop at the door of a miserable building of loose stone. With a thatch so sunk and rotten that the roof tree and couples protrude in crooked corners like the bones of the wretched horse with enormous head and ears that drag them to the door. The long, gaunt man gets down, his sinister face grimed like his hands. It was the same grimy giant who had accosted her on the lonely road near Deadman's Greich, but she feels that she must go through with it now, and she follows him into the house. Two rushlights were burning in the large and miserable room, and on a coarse ragged bed lay a woman groaning piteously. Rushlights are like the cheapest possible way to create a candle, I guess. You kind of just dip some cloth in fat or wax. That's Lady Lairdale, says the gaunt dark man, who then began to stride up and down the room, rolling his head and stamping furiously and thumping one hand on the palm of the other and talking and laughing in the corners where there was no one visible to hear or to answer. Old Mal Kark recognized in the faded, half-starved creature who lay on the bed, as dark now and grimy as the man, and looking as if she had never in her life washed her hands or face, the once blithe and pretty Laura Lou. The hideous being who was her mate continued in the same odd fluctuations of fury and grief and merriment. And whenever she uttered a groan, he parried it with another. <laughs> As Mother Clark, the Clark thought in a saturnine derision. At length, he strode into another room and banged the door after him. And in due time, the poor woman's pains were over and their daughter was born if you could call it that. Because what an imp. With long pointed ears, a flat nose, and enormous restless eyes and mouth, it instantly began to jabber and yell and talk in some unknown language. At the noise of which the father looked into the room, and told the sage femme that she should not go unrewarded. 
the sick woman seized the moment of his absence to say into the ear of Mull Clark, If he had not been at hill work tonight, he would not have fetched ye. Take no more now than your rightful fee, or he'll keep you here. And at this moment he turned with a bag full of gold and silver coins, which he emptied on the table and told her to help herself. She took four shillings, which was her primitive fee, neither more nor less, and all his urgency could not prevail with her to take a farthing more. He looked so terrible at her refusal that she rushed out of the house and he ran after her. You will take my money with you. He roared, snatching up the bank's bag still half full and flung it after her. It lighted her on the shoulder and partly from the blow and partly from terror, she fell to the ground where she came to herself. And when she came to herself, it was morning. She was lying across her own doorstone. It is said that she never told fortune or practice spells again. And though all that happened 60 years ago and more, Laura Silverbell, wise folk think, is still living and will so be forced to continue till the day of doom among the fairies. <clears throat> and that <clears throat> is Laura Silver Bell by Sheridan Levine. <clears throat> um, which obviously is not as uh, easygoing and charming as, as usual. Uh, oh, well, hello, Genera. Um, uh, Genera says, I'm late, but hi. Uh, that's okay. You, you missed mostly some dialogue about Laura falling in love. Um, <clears throat> Genera, wool clothes plus cold water means high levels of drowning back then. That is a good point. I had not considered that. Yeah, rivers... And crossroads and stuff, they have a lot of significance in crossing them and being forced to cross them. And whether, you know, spirits can even walk on them is questionable and so on. Holly's house said, sorry, I was in a parent meeting. Ooh, that sounds rough. <laughs> Thanks for dropping by, though, and, and, and watching the stream. Uh, Gia says, yike sounds like exorcist to me. I mean, I suppose. And Genera says, poor Laura. Indeed, poor Laura. Um, you know, it is interesting uh, reviewing a lot of folklore over a long period of time, how often the monsters of folklore are just abusive men analogies, whether it's abusive husbands or stalkers or whatever else. I'm not saying that's exclusively it. Obviously, it's not. But like around a great deal of the time, that's what it winds up being. And that's what we see here, of course. Um, at least in my opinion, this is obviously a, a metaphor about sort of losing someone to an abusive partner, you know, cut off from their family and in poor states, quick to anger, even to those who've helped them, deceptive, manipulative. Your friends can see what they really are and you can't and so on and so forth. It's grim, it's grim. Um, but impactful for it. <clears throat> Gennaro says Red Riding Hood is a well-known example. Exactly, yeah. I mean, depending on what version of the Beauty and the Beast trope you're reading, it, it's pretty substantial as well. Beauty and the Beast, of course, being the most famous iteration of a fairly standard trope that I think is more arguably not famous in pop culture because obviously Beauty and the Beast is this great Disney movie, but... Um, I think in terms of folklore, the more famous iteration of that is um, West to the Sun, East to the Moon. I'm always afraid I've got that name backwards, but that's also a, a similar idea. Except in that case, it's not quite as abusive as Beauty and the Beast could arguably be seen to be. Um, <clears throat> the um, overall, very, very common. The villains are... Uh, abusive husbands and so on. 
uh, which makes it, frankly, a little tough to find stories because, like, a lot of horror folklore is that. And then I'm like, how intense do I want to be? Like I mentioned last week, I've been really on the fence about whether I should read a Selkie story because they are horrifying, but they're they're grim abusive husband stories. That's what they are. Uh, and they are grim. Um, <laughs> nothing happy happens in those or exciting or, or justice or anything like that. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, that, it, it's not that every story needs to be that way. It's just I got to consider the mood of the stream. <laughs> you know, I just told a story about a poor woman being trapped forever because she was a silly little girl who got charmed. Anyways, as I said before, um, old horror stories and weird fiction tends to be more atmospheric and unsettling than, like, obviously horrifying, right? I think the horror here is not so much there's a particular line of description about the terrible things that they're seeing, you know, maggot infested, whatever, whatever. It's a lot more subtle, and it's not for everybody. But for people who do like it, like me, Sheridan Le Fan is perhaps one of the best at it. <clears throat> um, again, not technically folklore, but obviously heavily inspired by Irish folklore, of which we've read a lot on this channel before. Um, hopefully the, the, his writing the accent in didn't mess too many people up. Um, normally I try to dodge around that a bit, but uh, it was hard to do with this piece. And overall, I hope that the story uh, gave you a little bit of a chill, I guess. <clears throat> uh, if you liked the stream, consider giving it a like. It doesn't really help the stream. We're in a quiet corner of the internet here. It's just a way of saying, you know, good job. Uh, so do it if you think so. Um, and if you are not subscribed, we're going to be doing a few more stories. I may even do another Sheridan LaFan story. I, I have the pressure of this uh, the Tuesday at the end of the month, the October 31st Tuesday, the Halloween day is a Tuesday, which means it's got to be good. Like, it's got to be spooky. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, we'll see what I can come up with. Uh, the uh, the other thing I'll say is that I'm looking at doing uh, kind of like what I did with the Valrydas last week with Revenants which are, I guess I won't explain here, but I guess you could sort of see them as German vampires. Um, which, if you know Revenants, you might go, no, they're not, but you'll see. They kind of are in, in, in German lore. <clears throat> I'm considering that. So let me know if that interests you guys. Um, because it is more lore than tale. Like, I'm trying to make balance here because the Valrida one wasn't really a lot of, like, long involved stories it was sort of short snippets about these creatures that suffocate you in your sleep um and this would be more like that than today where it's sort of a long form story with a lot of atmosphere so let me know which ones interest you so that i can know what people want to hear beyond that thank you so much genera and gs for keeping me company and of course i'll keep the fire warm I think there's something at your window.